Hello, and, and welcome to the latest installment of Open Lectures on Freemasonry. I'm Susan Mitchell Summers, Professor of History at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. This is the last lecture of 2021, and uh, good riddance, I think, right? And we already have a very impressive roster of both familiar and, and new lecturers lining up to edify and entertain us all in 2022. Thank you for your participation and your support. There'll be time at the end of the lecture for questions and answers. And if you have questions at any time, please enter them into the chat function of Zoom. I was introduced to Masonic research as a collective activity in 2004 when I attended one of the conferences organized by Andrew Prescott at the Center for Research into Freemasonry and Fraternalism at the University of Sheffield. The first person I met at the hotel after schlepping my way from the train station on a damp November day was the late but eternally memorable Michelle Brodsky, who gave me fair warning of the many strange and engaging characters I was about to meet. He was not wrong. I entered the labyrinth of Masonic scholarship at a time when archive doors were opening to non-Masons, enabling and encouraging academics to share in the joint effort, still ongoing, of sorting fact from pious fiction and teasing out the myriad threads of Masonic history, evolution, culture, and influence. It was in many ways a magical time during the 1990s and the first decades of the 21st century when the elder generation of Masonic scholars, most of the members of the craft, uh, opened themselves to sharing what they had learned and passing on questions that still challenged them. This generosity of spirit was most apparent to me at the comfortably small conferences held at the Canterbury Masonic Research Center in the leafy London neighborhood of Islington, where scholars of all disciplines and formations gathered beneath the richly decorated plaster ceiling of the great chamber emblazoned with the year it was done, 1599. If the presentations did not engage your full attention, perish the thought, you could gaze up at the patterns framing heroic portraits of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and other worthies. Canterbury House and the adjacent beacon of Bacon's Tower drew an amazing mix of students, academic and Masonic scholars, and curious neighborhood folk who descri defied description. This is where I first met today's speaker, Rob Collis. You wondered when I'd get around to him, didn't you? An Englishman by birth, Rob is married to a Russian scholar and currently lives in the United States where he is visiting professor of history at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Rob took his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Sussex and his PhD at the University of Turku in Finland. He is impressively published and multilingual and absolutely charming. He has research interests that range geographically from Russia to Wales and thematically from 18th century British women's societies to the St. Petersburg Order of the Anti-Sobers, which sounds like a lot of fun. Today's talk is derived from his recent Oxford publication, Initiating the Millennium the Avignon Society, which he co-authored with Natalie Baer. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Rob to this audience and you're all in for a real treat. But before the treat, we have just a moment of observance. Um, Cecile, could you? Yes, right. Well, thank you very much, Susan and um... Yes, um, I, I'm very sad to announce the death of a, of a friend who was um, a scholar of Freemasonry. And when I say scholar of Freemasonry, you see, he was not an academic, but he um, really developed this personal interest in Freemasonry, Jean-Charles Nair. Jean-Charles Nair, 
um, wrote extensively on Freemasonry and symbolism. And he was really um, uh, adamant that all scholars of Freemasonry should retain a critical distance. And even though he was a dedicated Mason, he always retained that critical distance, you see. And therefore, when he discussed symbolism, he always said, well, look, um, uh, uh, symbols are tools. Uh, we should not be uh, simply obsessed by, by symbols. We should really uh, remain this, uh, retain this um, critical distance. And, and so he, he actually took part in a lot of symposiums on Freemasonry. And he became a member of the list quite late when I asked him to, to join. And therefore, uh, Andrew Prescott was, was really also pleased to have him on the list, I know. And he, what I just want to say is that he, he belonged to this generation of um, historians of Freemasonry who really wanted to share everything they had. And so every time he found uh, archives, you know, or uh, uh, something really useful and new, he shared it. Right, he let me know, and I think that was um, well, that was something. So, thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words about him. And let me tell you that I'm really very happy to uh, listen to, to Rob today because I was also there when I met him yeah. at Canonbury Center several years ago. And he also, I was very grateful because he also took part in this dictionary that uh, right. we all worked for, a biographical dictionary. So many thanks. Rob, I think it's your turn. I'll unmute myself and then Okan, I'm just going to um, put my screen share and get a, a small PowerPoint presentation up. Can we see the PowerPoint? Yep, good. Um, yes. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Because I had to unmute myself again. Good. Um, Thank you, Susan, for your introduction and to Cecile. Um, I remember the Canonbury Conference in 2008 very well. I had just begun um, as a research fellow at the uh, Centre for Research into Freemasonry and Fraternalism at uh, Sheffield with Andrea Dernafel as director. So I had uh, been there only a month um, and Canonbury was a great introduction to the area. Um, I'm also very grateful to the organisers of the Open Lectures on Freemasonry um, series, Okan Yunusoglu and Remzi uh, Zande, for the opportunity to speak to you today about the Avignon Society, also known as the Illuminae d'Avignon, the Union, and the New Israel Society. Lots of different names there. Um, it is a group that has fascinated me since I did become a research fellow at the Centre for Research uh, into Freemasonry and Fraternalism at the University of Sheffield in 2008. My initial interest in the society centered on its activities in Russia and in the first decade of the 19th century in particular. However, I soon came to realize that the society had a truly pan-European scope that demanded a broader historical perspective. I could talk to you today on a host of themes related to the Avignon Society, its fervent embrace of millenarianism, its early debt to Sweden Swedenborgianism, as well as the group's incorporation of many strands of Western esotericism, including alchemy, arithmancy, and theurgy. However, given the nature of this lecture series, I think it is wholly appropriate that I should limit myself today to the topic of the society's links to Freemasonry. For 28 years, between 1779 and 1807, the Avignon Society was a highly distinctive initiatic group that practiced a type of esoteric and millenarian sociability that was very attractive to many of the European continent's foremost proponents of Illuminist forms of Freemasonry. In talking about Illuminists, I am not referring to the Bavarian Illuminati associated with the anti-clerical and rational philosophy of Adam Weishaupt. Instead, I have in mind the Illuminae of the late 18th and early 19th centuries 
who were the focus of a groundbreaking study by August Viat in the 1920s. As highlighted by Viat, exponents of what he called Illuminism never formed a united group, but merely shared common characteristics, namely a pre-romantic fascination in occult philosophy, theurgy, and millenarianism. I would argue that a symbiotic relationship existed between the leading exponents of the Avignon Society and Illuminist Freemasons across Europe. On the one hand, many Illuminist Freemasons were drawn to several distinctive features of the Avignon Society. Its millenarian religiosity, its extraordinarily esoteric consecration ritual, and the manner in which the entire family of a prospective candidate could also possibly be consecrated. On the one hand, the leaders of the Avignon Society benefited enormously for over a quarter of a century from successfully fostering extremely close connections to various strands of Illuminist Freemasonry. At several critical points in the society's history, it was able to dramatically expand its membership by actively utilizing pre-existing Masonic networks. More specifically, let me just change my slide. More specifically, in this paper, I will focus on three particular periods in which a society successfully courted Freemasons from distinct Masonic networks. Firstly, a seemingly targeted campaign in Valence and Avignon in Southern Thrones between 1784 and 1787. After Antoine Joseph Pernetti, one of the founders of the society, had relocated to the area from Berlin. Secondly, the years between 1787 and 1790, when the Avignon Society actively promoted itself to illuminist groups and individuals across Europe. And thirdly, an 18 month period between 1805 and 1807 in St. Petersburg, when Tadeusz Grabianka, a Polish aristocrat, and another key founding member of the society took up residence in the Russian capital and managed to win over many of the leading Freemasons of the Rosicrucian Dying Sphinx Lodge. Nevertheless, it is important to emphasize that at no time was the Avignon Society ever a Masonic Lodge that practiced its own high degree right. It is vital to stress this point as it is an erroneous notion that still enjoys some level of credence. On the dust jacket of the book I published last year with Natalie Bayer on the Avignon Society, Professor Andre Zorin of the University of Oxford comments that sources are often unreliable when attempting to trace the history of esoteric societies. This statement rings very true in regards to a great deal of secondary source literature on the Avignon Society in general, and more particularly on the links it had with Freemasonry. One need only type in Illumine d'Avignon on any web browser to see the resilience of the myth of the Avignon Society being a distinctive Masonic lodge. The first hit takes you to the Wikipedia entry on the society, which begins by, by declaring that the Illuminate Avignon is the name of a Masonic lodge that was founded in Avignon in 1784 by Ternetti. Only the last part of this opening sentence is partially correct. Ternetti, a former Benedictine monk and the librarian to King Frederick II of Prussia, was indeed a co-founder in Berlin in 1779 of the society that came to be known as the Illuminate Avenue. Yet for all its faults, a Wikipedia entry is only as bad as the sources it utilizes. In this case, the anonymous author cites an article on the Illuminate Avenue in a French Masonic encyclopedia published in 1999. However, after help from uh, friends, Masonic friends, friends on the, the list such as Cecile and Susan, I found that no such entry is present in this publication. Nonetheless, the crux of the founding myth found on the Wikipedia entry 
can be traced back to a real secondary source, Jean-Marie Ragon's Orthodoxie Masonique of 1853. Herein, the author describes the so-called Rite of Panetti, which he attests without evidence was a hermetic system created by Panetti in 1766. But Agon also directly links this supposed rite with the genuine Academy de Frémes Masson that came into existence in Avignon in 1774. Indeed, he published the ritual of the Vrai Masson degree, replete with hermetic and alchemical symbolism. This claim and the accompanying description of the ritual was repeated almost verbatim by Jean Bricard. in 1927 in his influential work on Pernetti and the Illuminé d'Avignon. The enduring appeal of Bricot's work is testified by appearing as the second hit on web searches for Illuminé d'Avignon. The Ragon narrative may well remain seductive, but it tells a will-o'-the-wisp story that lacks any firm substance. According to Ragon, the key protagonist in this narrative, Panetti, was an active and pioneering Freemason in Avignon in the mid-1760s. In 1974, Robert Amadou stressed that it was superfluous to point out all the errors and legends in Ragon's thesis. Two decades later, the eminent Masonic scholar Pierre Molière found proof that Panetti is recorded as being a Freemason of the Royal York de Lodge in Berlin in 1782, but added that in his search for secret divine knowledge, the famous Benedictine seems to have preferred the Swedenborgian circles rather than the lodges. In addition, a number of scholars, including Jan Snoot, who we have the pleasure of uh, his company today on, uh, at my talk, um, have poured more cold water and Ragon's narrative. First, there is absolutely no evidence that Pernetti was even in Avignon in 1766, let alone that he was a member of any Masonic lodge in the papal enclave at this time. Indeed, it has been correctly noted that there is no evidence that any Masonic lodge was active in the city between 1751 and 1774. Prior to examining the ways in which the Avignon Society was able to expand by attracting new initiates from the Masonic lodges of Valence and Avignon in the 1780s, it is worth briefly discussing the group's links to Freemasonry during its formative years in Berlin between 1779 and 1783. Three individuals came together to play crucial roles in establishing the Avignon Society in the Prussian capital in early 1779. The aforementioned Pernetti and Grabianka, and lastly, Louis Guiton de Morveau, otherwise known as Brumo. Like Pernetti, Brumo was a lapsed clergyman. In the 1770s, he enjoyed a career as something of a court poet and playwright at Versailles, before moving to Berlin in 1778, where he was patronized by Prince Hunt, Heinrich, the brother of the Prussian monarch. Significantly, of these three, only Pernetti was a Freemason. And as mentioned, he seems to have refrained from playing an active role in the fraternity in Berlin. Yet, this is not to say that society was not attractive to Freemasons in Berlin at this time. Most notably, the Frenchman Charles-Pierre de Morimbal also a member of the Royal York de la Mitte Lodge, played an active role in society until 1782, particularly in regard to their shared alchemical endeavors. However, it is not clear how Pernetti and Morimbar became acquainted in Berlin. It is not until Pernetti relocated to Valence in the south of France at the end of 1783 to be near his brother and his family, that we are able to discern a much clearer picture of how Pernetti utilized associational networks 
to effectively establish a new cohort of alumni. On taking up residence in Balance, Pernetti did not join any lodge in the town. Instead, he devoted his energy to helping establish the Society of Academic, um, the Société Académique et Patriotique de Valence in 1784. Pernetti was elected the vice president and secretary of the society on its foundation. And for around three years, he played a very active role in promoting its associational and intellectual culture. It is no coincidence that all four of the new initiates into the Illuminé d'Avignon in 1785, François-Louis de la Rachardier, Antoine Etienne Bouche, Claude-François Delhomme, all of whom were physicians, and Thomas de Rosier, a captain in the Royal Engineering Corps, and the son-in-law of Pernetti's brother, were also founding members of the Société Académique et Patriotique. Thus, the academic society's learned form of sociability proved a conducive recruiting ground for Panetti. Moreover, the associational culture of the academic society overlapped with the area's Masonic networks of sociability. Significantly, only Richardier appears not to have been involved in Masonic life in Valence or Avignon. Both Delhomme and Rosier were prominent members of La Sagesse Lodge in Valence, with the former fulfilling a variety of roles from 1774, and the latter being Venerable Master in 1783. In many respects, the Masonic credentials of Bouge were even more noteworthy. Indeed, with some justification, it is possible to point to Bouge rather than Pernetti as the founder of a distinctive hermetic rite in Avignon. In 1774, Bouge played a, le played a pivotal role, for example, in the establishment of the Lodge Saint-Jean de la Fidelité in Avignon. The Lodge was renamed Saint-Jean des Cos de la Vertu Persecute in 1775, after a papal inquisitor led a raid on Bouche's home. That Bouche alone was targeted by the papal authorities is an indication of his seniority within the lodge. Moreover, as Thierry de Zacon has noted, Bush was the central figure at this time in the creation of an academy of true masons, which he argues resembled the model of a Rosicrucian college in, a, in that it seems to have been solely established to further the study of alchemy in particular and occult philosophy more generally. The academy contains an additional three higher degrees, vrai mason, vrai mason sage, and vrai mason sage academicien. Above that are the Chevalier de l'Orient of the Mother Ecosse Lodge in Marseille. Little is known about the Academy of True Masons in Avignon. However, the ritual for the initiation of a, a vrai mason at the affiliated Academy in Montpellier which was established shortly after the one in Avignon, is documented. It is this ritual that Ragon equated with Pernetti, when really it owed its existence in large measure to Bouge. Henrik Bogdan provides a full English translation of this true Mason rite in his book, Western Esotericism and Rites of Initiation, published, I think, in 2008. It is unsurprising saturated in alchemical symbolism and the quest to perfect the Philosopher's Stone. Whilst we know next to nothing about the activities and precise rituals of the Masonic Academy in Avignon, we can glean information about its composition from the Lodge's table of members. Arguably the most striking piece of information in these documents is that only in 1784 did Bouge himself become the first sage academic within the Avignon Lodge, the highest degree. This honor came at the same time Bouche became an associate member of the academic society in Valence, thereby bringing him directly into the orbit of Pernetti. Furthermore, the alignment of alchemical adepts was also significantly bolstered 
by the arrival of Brumont in Avignon, who carried with him two files of supposed prima materia that he had obtained from Johann Muller, or Elias Artista, in northern Germany. Interestingly, the links between the Academy of True Masons in Avignon and the Illuminés of Avignon were not limited to Bouge. In 1786, for example, Bouge was joined by an, as an illuminé by Jean Agricole Le Blanc, who at the time was the only sage true mason in the Avignon Lodge. This made Le Bon the second most senior member of the Masonic Academy, and thus evidently a candidate deemed worthy of being privy to the esoteric knowledge of the Illuminate. Thus, until early 1787, Panetti oversaw a limited but effective recruitment campaign for the society he helped to establish in Berlin. He did this via the overlapping associational networks, which centered on the academic and patriotic society in Valence, but radiated out in the local area to include eminent and illuminous minded Freemasons. Pernetti was helped for several months in 1784 and 1785 by the presence of Brumont in Avignon, whose passion for alchemy was also a factor in promoting new adepts. However, Brumont would have been preaching to an empty church without Pernetti's ability to gather together a small flock of new disciples. Only at the beginning of 1787 did Grabianca arrive in Avignon after traveling extensively throughout Europe. His arrival ushered in a new era in the history of the Avignon society. It marks the beginning of the era of the seven brothers, Grabianca, Pernetti, Bouge, Richardier, Delhomme, Le Blanc, and Joseph Ferrier from Arles and a lawyer, three of whom, Bouge, Delhomme, and Le Blanc, were prominent local Freemasons. Whereas Panetti had been content to enlist new members from local associational networks, the arrival of Guarabianca led to something of a targeted publicity campaign in which letters proclaiming the existence of the society were sent to a host of like-minded individuals and societies across Europe. Grabianca was the primary dynamo behind this effort. His aim was not simply to inform peers about the society, but also to invite them to join the group in Avignon. If one judges the success of this campaign by the number of illuminists that flocked to Avignon between 1787 and 1790, that it was a resounding triumph. Among the most notable Masonic visitors to Avignon at this time, for example, was the Saxon Karl Friedrich Thiemann, the Russian Sergei Ivanovich Plisheyev, and the Swede Gustav Reuterholm. Thiemann, the subject of a recent magisterial biography by Antoine Febvre, visited the Seven Brothers in Avignon as early as October 1787, after receiving a personal letter from Grabianca earlier in the year. In a letter to Jean-Baptiste Villemot, written whilst he was still in Avignon, Thiemann proclaimed that, and I quote, in the sincerity of my heart, I have never seen anything greater which bears more of the imprint of a higher vocation. A sense of religious ecstasy is also evident in the journal entries of Gustav Adolf Reuterholm at the time of his nine-day consecration into the society in December 1789. After the first day of his ceremony, Reuterholm wrote about how he had entered into, and I quote, the most holy of all covenants with the Most High in the foothills of the Alps. After completing his consecration on the ninth day, he wrote about how the experience will be, and I quote again, deeply ingrained in my heart for time and eternity. 
After completing his consecration in Avignon, Reuterholm was instructed to immediately travel to Rome to visit Ottavio Capelli, the, the society's Italian prophet. The day of the first meeting of Capelli in Rome, on January the 19th, 1790, Reuterholm wrote, wrote to Duke Karl of Södermanland, the head of the Swedish Reich in Stockholm. In the letter, he describes how he was commanded to, and I quote again, to staff myself with hope, faith, and steadfastness, and then to travel to Rome in order to receive the light. Fascinatingly, Reuterholm perceives his physical and spiritual journey through a Masonic lens. He wrote about how he obeyed and passed through the entire allegories, allegories of the black degree. Through all the atrocities of the earth, he wrote. He continues by describing how he sought often with agony, with the cold sweat, with anxiety, until he finally found the promised supreme master and won the Acacia. It is telling that Reuterholm envisages his own journey from Avignon to Rome to see Capelli as redolent of the trials endured by a Masonic candidate during the Black Degree ritual, that is, the fourth degree in the Swedish Eklith ritual. Reuterholm's journal also documents the extent to which the Avignon's own associational network had expanded beyond Avignon and Valence by the autumn of 1789. Reuterholm had arrived in Paris in October 1789, where he quickly became acquainted with William Boussy, an English wine merchant and prominent Freemason. Boussy played a critical role in facilitating Reuterholm's initial contact with the Avignon Society. The day after dining with Boussy in Paris, Reuterholm wrote to Gravienta in Avignon, requesting admittance to the society so as to share in the sublime knowledge that the most merciful father has allowed in your sanctuary. It should be emphasized, however, that Boussy was far from being a mere intermediary. This is evident in a journal entry penned by Reuterholm nine days after his initial meeting with Boussy. Several meetings had taken place in the intervening period, but on this evening, the Swede described a gathering of all of this sect, members or at least admirers of the society in Avignon. This took place at Boussy's home. In other words, Boussy was at the head of an active Parisian circle of the Avignon society. Boussy not only played a pivotal role in Paris, but also in London, as it was he that liaised with figures in the English capital, including Benedict Chastani, who Susan has talked about um, last year, I believe, or this year, was it? I forget. Earlier this year, I think. Moreover, archival documents attest that Guillaume de Poul was at the head of a branch of the Avignon Society in Marseille in the late 1780s. De Poul was a leading Masonic figure in Marseille in the 1780s, and was a member of the saint jean de Corse Lodge in the city. By July 1788, the Paul, for example, had already successfully nominated four candidates who were admitted to the Avignon Society. What is more, he did not simply nominate prospective candidates, but also received preliminary instructions from the seven brothers in Avignon as to how to prepare them. The years between 1787 and early 1790 can be viewed in many ways as the golden era of the Avignon society. The seven brothers oversaw a rapid expansion of the society in Avignon, whilst Capelli, as the group's prophet, remained in regular communication from Rome. The advertising campaign unleashed by the seven brothers in early 1787 undoubtedly put the society on the Illuminist map, so to speak. However, the Seven Brothers also expanded their society by tapping into pre-existing Masonic networks, as they had done in Valence and Avignon in the early 1780s. By 1788, for example, 
They could rely on De Paul in Marseille, Boussy in Paris, and Chastanier in London as key Masonic advocates for the society. Events transpired in 1790 and 1791 to reduce the Avignon society to a much diminished rump. First, Avignon was rent asunder by the seismic events, the French Revolution, unfolding throughout France. Second, Ottavio Capelli was arrested in Rome in September 1790 and was consequently sentenced to seven years imprisonment by the Holy Office in November 1791. Members of the society were divided over whether to renounce the Italian as a false prophet. And then, so consequently, a schism occurred with Richardier and Ferrier, two of the seven brothers, not willing to abandon Capelli. Despite hardened circumstances, the Avignon Society continued to function in the city until October 1799, when meetings were suspended and never resumed. However, the society was to enjoy an Indian summer of sorts in St. Petersburg in Russia between 1805 and 1807, with Grabianka at the helm. The Polish nobleman arrived in the Russian capital in August 1805, and over the next 18 months before his arrest, at least 60 new members were initiated into what had become known as the New Israel Society. How can one explain the appeal of the New Israel Society among the Petersburg elite in the early 19th century? Grabianka seems to have been a charismatic leader, and his arrival in the Russian capital immediately provoked considerable interest and curiosity in some aristocratic circles. However, this interest was not simply based on the personality of one man. The New Israel Society was successfully able to harness the burgeoning strain of millenarianism among the Russian nobility that was propelled by the anxieties of war against Napoleonic France. Moreover, the society offered the Petersburg aristocracy a new form of mixed sociability that greatly appealed to noble women. This is testified by the fact that of the 60 new members consecrated in Petersburg, exactly half were women. Last but not least, the New Israel Society managed to win over many members of Petersburg leading high degree Freemasons after Grabianka's arrival in 1805. However, the groundwork for tapping into this rich reservoir of recruits actually began in August 1802, when Baron Louis Lefort, the Chancellor of the Avignon Society and a Mason of La Candeur Lodge in Strasbourg, arrived in Petersburg. He soon became the governor to the children of Natalia Plasheva, the widow of Sergei Plashevich, Plasheva, sorry, the first Russian member of the Avignon Society, he was consecrated in 1788, and a leading Freemason in Petersburg. This turn of events was extremely fortuitous or an inspired move. The latter seems more likely. Plesheva provided a very sympathetic base for Lefort. Furthermore, her home was also the residence of Alexander Linisiev, who had been Plesheva's closest friend and a fellow mason of some repute in the Russian capital. Thus, Lefort was able to cultivate connections to Petersburg's masons through Linisiev in advance of Grabianka's arrival in the city. It is no coincidence that Linisiev was the first person to be consecrated into the New Israel Society shortly after Grabianka reached Petersburg. In March 1807, Alexander Lapsin, the founder of the Rosicrucian Dying Sphinx Lodge in Petersburg in 1800, wrote that all the local brothers joined the New Israel Society following behind Alexander Lilistiv. Labzin initially remained aloof 
despite being encouraged to join the New Israel Society by several fellow Masons of the Dying Sphinx Lodge. However, as Labzin himself wrote, his reticence dissolved when he realized that those remaining loyal to him were wavering. Labzin describes how he met Grabianka in 1806, who allayed all his fears, namely that he would not have to abandon his Masonic connections and would not be forced to swear any oaths. He was subsequently consecrated into the New Israel Society in December 1806, alongside four other members of the Dying Saints Lodge, and along with his wife. The conversion of Labsin in late 1806 meant that the New Israel Society had effectively won over all prominent Freemasons in Petersburg in little over a year. Yet the speed and extent of this success may have been the undoing of Grabianka and the society he led. A mere month after Lapsin's consecration, Nikolai Novosiltsev, the head of the new Committee for the Preservation of General Security in Russia, wrote to Emperor Alexander himself, warning him of the dangers of state chanceries being full of Martinists, Israelites, Illuminates, and scoundrels of all shades. According to Novosiltsev, these scoundrels were agents of the insidious French government. In addition to coming to the attention of Russian statesmen, the su success of the New Israel Society in attracting so many members of the dying Sphinx Lodge, including Labzin, seems to have provoked the wrath of Oz Ozip Pozdeev, the leader of the Rosicrucian order in Moscow. On hearing of Grabianka's death in October 1807, Pozdeev could not help gleefully chastising his fellow brothers in the capital. He wrote, the messieurs from, from Petersburg who rushed headlong to him are now saying, as I hear, that he himself was obviously deceived. But before, they were talking about him as if he, like Jesus, had all the godly gifts. They had so much enthusiasm. Slabzin continued to remain loyal to Grabianka after his arrest in February 1807, which was a clear frustration to Pozdeev. Interestingly, two leading Russian Masonic scholars, Andrei Serkov and Yuri Kandakov, both claim that Pozdeev may have played a role in Grabianka's arrest. They point to the fact that the chief interrogator of Grabianka, Alexander Arsenian, was a close acquaintance of Pozdeev and a fellow Rosicrucian. It is impossible to ascertain whether there is any truth in this accusation, but what is clear is that Pozdeev detested Grabianka and what he referred to as Grabianism. The degree of animosity expressed by Pozdeyev may have been exceptional, but it does articulate a key dilemma faced by the Avignon Society throughout its existence. In utilizing Masonic networks and deliberately courting Masons, the leaders of the Avignon Society continually risk overstepping associational boundaries. For Freemasons like Blapstein, this helps to explain his initial hesitancy in joining the New Israel Society. It also explains the wrath of Pozdeev, whose loyalty lay squarely with the Rosicrucian order. For him, Pozdeev, the New Israel Society was a dangerous deviational sect. Nevertheless, it should also be borne in mind that Pozdeev's hostility stands out precisely because it was extreme. For many years, especially between 1784 and 1789, the leaders of the Avignon Society seem to have been able to attract some of Europe's foremost Illuminist Freemasons without arousing the ire of their brethren. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I will stop the uh, PowerPoint too. Very good. 
All right, it's it's time for questions. If if you, oh come, I don't see anything in chat. Are we waiting for? Uh, because for there is nothing on the chat, Susan. Unbelievable. So, um, if we could. Uh, not focus on me and instead open it up a little bit and uh, see if we can get most of the people on the screen or a lot of people on the screen. Yes, Cecile, you have a question. Um, sometimes uh, when uh, Masonic orders of the past were wrapped up, they resurfaced or uh, they get uh, integrated into a new order, which is uh, still meeting today or active in some form today. Uh, what was uh, this order about? And uh, what were their rituals like? And uh, do you see uh, any resemblance uh, of uh, their rituals and uh, the theme with uh, any of the orders that are present today. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I might defer to Jan Snoop on this one. Um, I certainly know something about the, uh, the actual consecration rituals of the Avignon Society, which were extremely elaborate, um, which involved a nine day ceremony at the foothills of the Alps, um, involved uh, sort of almost monk-like um, preparation for that um, and then um, the ceremony itself would last for nine days where a candidate would um, go to the foothills of the Alp and perform very um, um, uh, rich uh, ceremonials um, in which the theurgical um, rites uh, could potentially take place in which they were able to uh, communicate with a guardian angel um, now, whether or not there is anything similar in the uh, in the continued, I doubt it. But I I will uh, stand to be corrected by Jan if Jan um, is here and he would know much more about that. I think that personally, the Avignon Society's rituals were not unique. They were a, a development of traditions coming from the mountainist tradition, maybe uh, from earlier in the 18th century, um, and of course you had. Um, than uh, Jean-Baptiste Villemotte's, but I, I am not sure as to whether anything so um, um, rich uh, continued afterwards. I would doubt it very much. Yeah, can I defer to you? Can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that comes close to this. Uh, there may be such big, some links to things like the Golden Dawn and uh, the Societas of Trujillo in Anglia. Uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's the only direction in which I would assume that there might be some influence. Uh, rituals that complex as this group had, uh, I'm not aware of existing today. Thanks, Jan. We need to go to Cecile next, I believe. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for this. <laughs> um, I, I, I just have um, a, a very silly question, probably, but, um, you know, I mean, given the fact that they, they were very active just before the French Revolution and even during the French Revolution, although, uh, as you explain, you know, just like some lodges, uh, they, of course, uh, slowed down. I mean, their activity um, came. Well, I mean, did they have any link at all with the Illuminati, with the Bavarian <laughs> Illuminati, or did they react strongly against them because i i expect they were very different from what you said yes right? yes as far as i'm aware there were absolutely no links and i'd be very surprised um because of the um the only um link tenuous link i came across and again others can correct me if i'm wrong here was um the saxon um carl frederick Timon um seems to have had some links to figures in the Illuminati, 
um, in, um, and he was very close to the Avignon Society without being a full member. But of the key members of the Avignon Society themselves, no, nothing at all. They were this different strand of the, you know, of the, um, the more the theosophical, um, illuministic strand that um, Badil, Baduel and Robinson, Robinson um, referred to. So they. There was this conflation, as, as Andreas Dernerforce has written about as well, um, quite a lot between this Illuminati and the Illuminae and confusion, which was also a factor in Russia when they were, when Grabyanka was arrested and persecuted. They, the Russian authorities believed that he was somehow this kind of mixture of this Illuminati type figure and this um, Illuminae figure with the theosophy, the um, millenarianism. So that would be my answer. No, in short, um, not to my knowledge. Um, anyone else is um, welcome to come in on that. Well, before we do that, <laughs> there's a question from Alex uh, who wants to know if, if the um, Avignon Society made an impression on, on the development of, of Mormon theology and, and practice. Ooh. That's the Swedenborgians did. Yes, uh, I would. But, I mean, I I am no expert on the history of Mormonism. Um, I would imagine not because they were these documents, these archival things, um, which I looked at um, to write the book, um, were pretty hard to come by and weren't easily accessible. Um, so I doubt that any of the founding um, Fathers, I think it was mainly men, I presume, um, would have had access to any of the um, um, uh, rituals, uh, beliefs of the Illuminate Avenue. So my my, this is I'm speculating here. I would doubt very much whether they would have been fully aware of um, the detailed workings of the Illuminate Avenue. You know, they might not have been directly aware, but. I know that in my own work on Ebenezer Sibley, I found that through his enormous works on astrology, uh, a lot of the Swedenborgian ideas filtered through uh, because of course his, his brother was a Swedenborgian minister. And then those texts were disseminated, you know, Sibley. You know yeah, and you had um, Pernetti and Brumo um, writing early trans French translations of Swed Swedenborgian works in the early mid 1780s. So the Swedenborgian side through the translations is one area um, mm -hmm. that could have been a, a loose influence. This may be Swedenborg. your next book. It, it, this may be your, <laughs> it always does. This may be your next book. Um, does anyone have a question? I can only see some people, so if you yeah, raise your hand. Uh, sorry, if there's no one, I'll ask my second question. Okay. Okay. And why was it called the New Israel Society? And you were talking about the nine-day ritual by the mountainside, and uh, that echoes with uh, some of the ancient uh, biblical history. And uh, was this uh, something to do with... Uh, uh, the deeper and uh, unseen layers of uh, uh, Abrahamic mysticism. I didn't catch that last uh, uh, few words there, but I think it, in general, um, it was in the spirit, going back to Swedenborgianism and the New Jerusalem Church, the idea of the millenarian side of the society um, and the belief that the group... Um, was going to, uh, they were the chosen people, and that consecration into the New Israel Society, um, you were then among this chosen few. It, it was very, it was a similar sort of um, outlook to some forms of Swedenborgianism in that way. I, mean, I would I argue millenarianism was a key feature of this group, and that's something they shared with the Swedenborgians in a different it was it manifested itself in a different way, um, but that was key to an understanding the Avignon society, I, I believe. 
Well, you know, key to understanding them and the Swedenborgians and everybody else all over the shop at, at that time. It was, yeah. it was a, a, a massive and entirely decentralized <laughs> phenomena. Okay. Uh, does, does anyone else have a question? Yes. I, I um, see one hand up. Yeah, Tev, Tev, oh, I'm sorry. I can't say your name right. I'm going to botch it. Yeah, no, okay, no problem. My name is Tevik. Uh, I would like to thank Robert for this uh, wonderful, phenomenal uh, presentation. Is there any resemblance between the Avignon Society and the Shriners? Again, um, I mean, there's a general, I'm not an expert on the Shriners, I must uh, I, I know must about say. the Shriners. <laughs> My yes, grandfather I, was a Shriner. <laughs> there, you know, I know the basics about the Shriners and um, I would say there's a general, you know, you, uh, coming out of the 18th century esoteric tradition, um, but it, maybe Susan or Jan would know more about the yeah, Shriners than me. Well, Oh. Jan was shaking his head, uh, no, but, okay. but let me just say that I, I think the Shriners and, uh, and Adam, if he's still here, would know. Mm. I think the Shriners developed much later and largely uh, as a social club uh, attached to, to Freemasonry. Um, you know, funny hats and motorcycles and parades and, and ra raising money for charity. Um, so yeah, and Jan agrees with me. So I, Adam, I, Adam's my, I see they open hospitals, Shriners hospitals here in the United States, and they wear yes. fezes. But um, I don't believe they go through um, nine-day consecration rituals, for example, <laughs> to become well, a Shriner. No, but, uh, but if you, no, no, but if you go to uh, the Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, you have to take the elevator up to the ninth floor to get to the Shriner exhibit. So maybe the, the, the shrine is has more in common with the uh, 1870s late 19th century uh, uh, Orientalism and also including the Zouaves who yeah. uh, uh, dressed as uh, uh, Arab men in the Civil War. So much more in common with that. And you know, yeah, mostly fantasy than, than anything. Direct. And I suppose in some ways it goes back to even the Rosicrucian, uh, you know, looking at the the Eastern um, knowledge, you know, this um, fascination in Eastern wisdom. But there's not so much in that in the uh, Illuminate Avignon. It's not, uh, they're not looking East. They're much, very much uh, looking at Christian um, forms of ritual practice and, and esoteric beliefs. Um, but not really looking to the east at all. So. And their own navels, I think. And, <laughs> and then, they're looking at their own navels. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. Is Thank there you. another question? Yeah, Jan. I would like to comment on things that have been said so far. Uh, <clears throat> the Illuminati and the Illuminist uh, so the Bavarians and the Avignons, uh, so to say, uh, shared one thing with actually common mainstream mid 18th century Freemasonry, namely Utopianism. Uh, Utopianism. Uh, they looked at the world in a ut utopian way. They wanted to create a better world they were uh, imagining an utopian uh, ideal world, uh, which by outsiders often has been misunderstood as something that they wanted to realize in the real world and in real time, which basically was not really true. They projected it as a, a goal to work towards and uh, that is something that's created within Freemasonry in the mid 18th century. You find it in the ritual books of the 1740s, and uh, which is picked up by both these currents, but independently, and they uh, develop independently. But they they have their roots in this tradition. Can I add, if I can, there to Jan's point about utopianism and 
Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. And um, one other slight area of overlap between the Illuminati and the Illuminates is why they were so feared by the um, authorities is that there was something subversive um, in the Illuminati, in their mill millenarianism, in, the, in that they were not advocating, um, in a sense, the preservation of the status quo. They were, uh, you know, uh, predicting huge cataclysmic upheavals in which the status quo, the Pope, monarchs would be overthrown. Yeah, and that scared that scared the hell out of monarchs from Catherine the Great to George the Third in England. And so, in that way, they 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 did share. That's one other area they shared that they were. Yeah, um, yeah but that were uh, utopian ideas. Yeah, that were not aims that they were really working after in the real world of there and then. Yeah, that's where they did. I think you're right. Utopianism and this and feared by the authorities for, yeah. their, uh, for these. And actually, the, the French Revolution scared them very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we have a, another question. Uh, we have lots of questions. OK, so here's <laughs> he, here's one I'm I'm going to, to pass over for just a moment on the Illuminati and, and go on to um, David's question about uh, to what would extent would you consider them as an esoteric learned society? I think he meant learned. Learned. Yeah. Um, I'm pausing for a second. I would to an extent. Um, Pernetti certainly um, came through um, joining um, learned academic societies in Berlin. He then went to found this academic society in Valence. Um, so I certainly think with Pernetti, he was trying to um, learn about the secrets of the world and the universe and um, higher. Um, so for him, um, I think it, it varies for individual members within the society. Um, but I think there's an aspect of it um, within particularly Pernetti. Others, it, it was almost like a monastic order for them um, to belong to. Others um, engaged in it more for alchemical um, pursuits. So it was a mixture of all these things and it could be different things to different members. And, but I would point to Pernetti as the um, a key figure there for it representing something of a learned society, separate to the learned society that he created in Valence. It's sort of an overlapping interests um, in that. Brilliant. Well, I think we're about done. Rob, um, do you want to say any last? I just, I'm looking at the chat and, um, oh, it's a long, sorry. Sivasu uh, Brahmanian. Uh, um, you asked to, to, illum um, to illuminate, to uh, elaborate a little more on the difference between Illuminati and Illuminate. Um, we touched on that a bit already, um, and Jan did as well there. I don't know if that was enough. Um, uh, they're, they're just very different. Yeah, rational Illuminati, very uh, really uh, idiot's guide to it. Short, Illuminati, believers in the Enlightenment, rational, anti-clerical, uh, on the other hand, Illuminate. In a way, very opposite to that. Um, very uh, spiritually minded, the theosophy, theosophy, believers in the occult philosophy, looking into the secrets, occult secrets of nature, looking um, at um, inner religions. So really diametrically opposite in many ways, apart from, as Jan just said, this overlapping maybe utopian and what I said, the, the subversive um, points that the authorities picked up on. But other than that, diametrically a different yeah I, I i think it's it's the fact that the names are so close um that that causes a false association really and i would say this comes this comes from the enlightenment itself it's it's you, people are looking for light in various ways whether that's through um yeah. rational enlightenment or other ways it's search a search for the truth and the light and wisdom and illumination or enlightenment, what's, you know, it's, it's all playing on, it's all very close to language there. I would say that it's this confusion of- Especially in words. French. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I need to wrap up. I need to thank all of you for coming. Rob, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Jan, for, for being here as our thank you. reference. And um, have have a lovely time until we, we join again in January. All right. Thank you, Susan. And yes. thank you, everybody, for, um, for coming. Thank you. Toodle.